Minesweeper is not the most exciting game in the world. For people under 20 who didn't grow up with Minesweeper as one of three or so pre-installed games on their Windows computers, it's basically a game where the user is presented with a grid and must figure out where the mines are by looking at the numbers on surrounding tiles to tell you how many mines they're adjacent to. Then you mark the mines, clear the safe tiles, and... and... that's it. That's Minesweeper. Send tweet. New revisions on this formula aren't exactly a new concept. Minesweeper dates back to the dawn of the computer age and variants have existed more or less since its inception. But with new computational power comes new possibilities. For example, all of this footage is from Globesweeper, an attempt to bring Minesweeper into the 21st century by making it 3D and letting you choose between traditional pentagon and hex grids. And it's fine if you're looking for a decent twist on Minesweeper, but despite the perspective twist, it's still pretty conventional. What's really interesting to me are titles that take this old, well-worn premise and try to spruce it up with new mechanics from completely different genres. And recently, two Minesweeper roguelikes have been brought to my attention, which is just so out there of an idea I had to go and check it out. The first is Radical Dungeon Sweeper. This game came out in 2018, but it feels kind of like a lost PopCap game from the mid-2000s in a lot of ways. It's got that GUI-driven gameplay thing going on, it's high on production value, and it renders at a 4.3 resolution. And it integrates its roguelike influences in a few obvious ways. First, you pick a character who has their own unique powers at the start of each game. Second, each grid has a start point and an exit. The goal is to get to the exit and ascend down the stairs to the next level of the dungeon, but unlike normal Minesweeper, you can't just clear points at random. You can only clear tiles that are adjacent to tiles you've already cleared, as if you're actually moving from the entrance to the exit. Also, instead of uncovering mines, you're uncovering monsters, which you need to kill for experience and money and keys to unlock the exit and various chests. Pinning them in traditional Minesweeper play by marking all the tiles around them gives you an advantage, as you can see whether they hold any items, and thus are whether they're worth your time, and also you get first strike on attacking them. You can also find swords and shields and other equipment that gives you a per-level damage or defense boost to make it easier to take them out without incurring damage. The cutesy cartoon images belie a game that is surprisingly punishing, though. For example, when you unlock a character they don't stay unlocked. You unlock them until they die, at which point they're thrown back in jail somewhere in the dungeon waiting to be unlocked again. The only character always unlocked is the sort of boring default guy. This effectively means 99% of your games will be played with him and makes losing as the other characters super distressing. There's also a time management element. Each turn you spend fighting, sweeping areas, and using items brings a game-ending monster closer to you. There are ways to mitigate that, but it reorients the emphasis away from completely clearing the board like in traditional Minesweeper and towards getting to the next level as fast as you reasonably can. It's definitely more of a game that uses Minesweeper mechanics as a base, but then builds out to a puzzle-based roguelike from there. This is in contrast to the other Minesweeper roguelike I found, called Demon Crawl. Demon Crawl is much more traditional in its implementation of Minesweeper, leaving the core rules of the game more or less untouched. Unlike Radical Dungeon Sweeper, you can absolutely click anywhere you want, and you don't really do battle on the map or look for an exit. Your goal is Minesweeper's goal. Just find the mines slash monsters and mark them while clearing the rest of the board. The roguelike elements are more incidental here. First, the puzzles are in the context of a big, sprawling campaign. Start in the forest with a small, easy beginner's puzzle, and move through caves and tombs and volcanoes that each have more powerful enemies or a higher likelihood of modifiers. There are dozens and dozens of items and curses to help and hinder you, but they're not that important? They supplement the Minesweeper gameplay in ways that can make a mistake instantly fatal or help you clear an area more quickly or safely, but the bulk of the game is this. It's also kind of bullshit. Like, if there's one thing that this game actually takes more inspiration from traditional roguelikes than Radical Dungeon Sweeper, it's how readily random number generators will just straight up murder you. Which I guess also comes from Minesweeper. I also ended up doing a lot of research on Minesweeper while playing this game, and I love this quote from Minesweeper.info. Quote, Sometimes in Minesweeper you need to guess. A typical case is a 50-50 situation where one mine is hidden in two squares. Guess quickly and move on. Thinking does not improve your chance of guessing correctly, it only wastes time. Waiting to see if you guessed right also wastes time. So assume you survived and try to keep playing. Do not delay taking forced guesses. Solving the rest of the board first is a waste of time if you end up guessing the wrong square. End quote. Minesweeper fans do not screw around. 
Anyway, stuff like that makes me realize how much of a natural fit these two genres are, given how easily random number generators can screw you in either of them. Regardless, where Radical Dungeon Sweeper feels friendly but is cruel for locking its player characters back up, Demon Crawl is just mercilessly difficult. It's so unflinching in its difficulty that, like I said, I had to start reading up on strategy on how to actually play Minesweeper. Like, sure, I knew the basics, but now I know all about 1-2-1 and 1-2-2-1 patterns because I was sick of dying to what I felt were random deaths. Ultimately, if you're in the market for a highly polished, not super deep roguelike with some Minesweeper-inspired elements, try out Radical Dungeon Sweeper. It's easier to get into and it's prettier to look at. But if you're a die-hard Minesweeper fan looking for a new challenge, or maybe just a Minesweeper game with a campaign mode, Demon Crawl is surprisingly addictive, providing just enough grindy unlockables and level-to-level -level strategy to keep me coming back, despite still not even beating the first quest. And it's cool to see two such radically different takes on an idea that at first blush seems just utterly bizarre. And switching gears from near-narrative-free Minesweeper puzzles, let's talk about a story-driven game. In some distant memory, you play as The Professor, a scientist, historian, and a citizen of one of only two known remaining colonies of humans on an Earth ruined by an explosion of corrosive, toxic algae. You're on a mission to scour the Earth for survivors, for salvage, or to recover and record Earth's lost history. Along with you is Commander Ty, a survivor from the other colony, and Aurora, an artificial intelligence that's capable of recreating a simulation of the past through context clues. While out on an expedition in hopes of finding any sort of non-algae plant life, you accidentally stumble into a cave untouched by the algae's corrosion. And as you explore what seems to be a strange and alien landscape, it quickly becomes apparent that this was a house from just before the collapse. The professor jumps at the opportunity to explore the world that was, while Commander Ty helps remotely while seeking shelter from an incoming algae storm above. From a gameplay perspective, Some Distant Memory is a lot like a 2D version of Tacoma. You walk around now-empty hallways looking at knickknacks and logs and data cards, discovering the past lives of those who came before you. In each room, once you've collected enough data, Aurora is able to generate a short simulation of what is likely to have happened there, but not always perfectly accurately. As you meander your way from room to room of this house, a story unfolds that spans three generations leading up to the collapse. There's Ada and Ernest, the oldest couple, Emmy, their daughter, and her son, Rickon, who grows up and inherits the house from his grandparents once he's an adult. And there's some sort of inherent melancholy in watching three generations play out all at once. To see Ada and Ernest be a happy middle-aged couple in one room, and then to see them be old and a little bit bewildered by popular culture in the next. Or to see Emmy bring home baby Rickon to her parents with such pride, and then to see her leave her toddler son with her grandparents to pursue an acting career out west. And that, I think, is what's brilliant about the use of the piecing together a story from context clues conceit here. It establishes a way to open up the scope of cause and effect by compressing all those years down to explorable snapshots. Causally connecting events 50 years apart from each other is a lot easier when they can both be displayed by holographic projections in the same room. And the game absolutely benefits from this time compression, because some distant memory is, at its heart, about climate change. Not directly, and not in an obvious or preachy way. Like, there's an undercurrent of environmentalism in a lot of the random periodicals you run into to make the parallel more obvious, but it's fundamentally a story of human tragedies that take lifetimes to play out. Some Distant Memory is a story of a family where each generation unknowingly dooms later ones, sometimes in very obvious and direct ways, and sometimes in ways that don't become apparent for years. But the focus is always on people, and the way that things we do today can have ripple effects down the line, both good and bad for those we care about. I don't want to oversell it too much, it's on par with young adult fiction on the subject, both in tone and in depth. But it's good young adult fiction that paints believable, fleshed-out lives across four separate generations of humans exploring this house and how they've inherited the boons and the problems of their elders. My only real complaint is that the game's world-building is... not great? Actively bad, maybe, even? Like, I don't want to denigrate a game that looks pretty and tells a tale of distant remorse, because this game is absolutely that, but it's also painful at times. Like, the programming language Rickon is writing his video game in is called MochaScript instead of JavaScript. And of course, his girlfriend, a real programmer, hates MochaScript. His favorite video game as a kid is Superb Mario, whose enemy is Browser. Among the movies in his room are copies of Under Forgiven and Jangle Most of the Way. So much of the game is this joke from Family Guy. If we pass a McDaniels or a Burger Queen, let's hop out. Oh, that's right, we're on television. Oh, I'd love a flame broil bopper. So frustrating, we all know what we're talking about. 
But that's just like a personal pet peeve of mine, and I don't want it to scare you away from the game if it otherwise seems up your alley. It does a great job of capturing the minutia and small, intimate moments of the lives of one early 21st century household. You just need to put aside the goofy Mad Magazine parody names to be able to enjoy it. Ultimately, the game's a plea for people to consider that their actions have reverberations that echo beyond their lifetimes. In an environmental context, yes, definitely, but also just in general. And that's kind of cool. So if you like Tacoma or Gone Home and that kind of material sounds up your alley, I'd strongly recommend it. It's kind of obvious, looking over my channel's coverage, that I'm not the world's biggest fan of sports games, or sports more broadly. I've played the occasional golf sim, round of Madden, Virtua Tennis Match, or NBA Jam here and there, but outside of an ongoing love affair with the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series, I haven't really followed, nor do I have strong opinions on, most sports titles. And I can't tell if that makes me more or less a mark for Football Drama, a 2019 game by Open Lab Games and Demigiant. In Football Drama, you play as Rocco Galliano, a football coach, that's soccer coach to American viewers, who had his career ended seven years ago by some controversies, but has been brought out of retirement to coach the Calchester Assembled Football Club. What sets Football Drama apart from the FIFAs and soccer manager sims of the world, though, is how it mixes elements of sports management sims with those of visual novels. In between matches, you have various encounters that can influence your ability to coach your team. You attend press conferences after each game to take credit for wins or assign blame for losses. You can meet with your club owner and keep his good graces, or don't. You can get offers you can't refuse from unscrupulous underworld types who can help you for a price. They don't really feel like role-playing choices or even story beats, though, so much as interactive narrative prompts to help generate stat changes to make things more interesting on the field. Do you turn down the mafioso offering you quote-unquote help in the next match and maybe lose as a result, or do you let him work his magic despite the fact that it puts you in his pocket? Or, for example, take the difficult choice when dealing with the press after a win. You can claim credit yourself, and the press will call you a selfish braggart, say that the win was thanks to the hard work of the team, at which point the press will say that your coaching doesn't really matter, or say it was just a lucky day, both angering the players and making you look unnecessary. A lot of these segments, though by no means all of them, repeat regularly, so it's not really a narrative choice, it's a gameplay one. If you have to take a hit, which hit do you take in order to keep coaching the team well? The soccer matches themselves take place in a turn-based manner. During each turn, you can decide to take a safe or a risky move, with risky moves being more likely to win and win big, but which come at a cost to both your team's short-term energy and long-term athletic stats, which get carried over from game to game. Additionally, you can issue cards that you earn both from how you perform as a coach during your soccer games and how your personal life is going. These can range from various formations and plays to stuff like intentionally starting a brawl on the field. The cards themselves take a few turns to go into effect, and when they do, you can either succeed or fail at them based on your relationship with your team or other statistics. If you succeed, some stats are modified in different ways, some good and some bad. If you fail, the stats don't move because the team just didn't listen to you. The end result is kind of fascinating to me, at least as someone who doesn't really do sports so much. It captures the back and forth, rise and fall excitement of a game of soccer as your team brings the ball close to the goal for a scoring shot, or as the enemy team does the same to your goal. But more than that, it separates you from play. Your calls aren't immediately reflected on the field, and even when they're received, they manifest as minute stat changes. The number of statistics that go into calculating your success or failure each button press is incomprehensibly overwhelming. Ultimately, all you're doing is making suggestions that the team could follow and deciding whether or not to play it safe or go hard each turn, but really it's up to the players represented through stats and dice rolls. In this way, it captures the sense of being a coach of a sports team nicely, where your influence is indirect and somehow both unbelievably important, but also intangible and easily dismissed as meaningless. The game has some fun with this, with Galliano engaging in existential debates about the necessity of his job and the function of the sport. It really exemplifies the ethereal influence that a coach has over a team, paradoxically really important and yet also kind of hard to point directly to. But it's also a good example of the limitations of perceivable consequence. 
The developers put up a YouTube video where the designer breaks down how it's not quote unquote just random and he's not wrong. In football drama, um, the, the way of handling and deciding and playing is very simple, but, the, but what's behind the scene is not so simple. So lots of things are taken into account, like uh, your team's athletic condition, uh, your team's 16 uh, power dimensions, which we'll see uh, soon, uh, but also whether it's your home and away, what's the weather, and so on. But also when you have this many statistics, weighted in ways you can't see, influenced by three wave functions with different periods, and modified by a stamina bar, all to result in outcomes that feel binary even if they aren't, since plays either push you towards the goal or not, the systems convey a sense of indifference to the player. <laughs> As a result, I don't know if it's a good sports game. I'm not the best person to ask. But also, it isn't really trying to be. It's less a soccer game than a game about soccer. The institution, the culture, the ritual and pageantry, the corruption of something pure through money, the tense moments of a scored goal or wide shot. It's a bit cynical and it's very European, but it's the most interesting game about a sport, rather than an adaptation of a sport, that I think I've ever played. So that's November's blips here in December. Last month was weird. I'll be back soon with even more semi-obscure games. In the meantime, I think I might want to revisit Star Wars for a bit.